Without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Silvana, Professor, I should say, Silvana Pereira uh, from IRCAT, uh, Strasbourg, France. I've known her for several years now, and I really watched her, uh, her uh, career grow. Uh, she became a professor of surgery at the University of Strasbourg. She's the director of the uh, Education Institute Hospitalier from Strasbourg, France, and she's also vice president uh, from IRCAT France. I dare say that she brought some elegance to the institution of IRCAT. She's uh, uh, excellent and fluent in English, and therefore I'm really looking forward to her talk, which will be uh, on the place of endoscopic procedures in the treatment of obesity. Silvana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques. Uh, very nice words. I'm flattered. And I hope to see very, very soon here at Erika in uh, uh, not only virtually, but I hope that uh, we can have an on-site in-person meeting soon uh, after this uh, uh, COVID pandemic. I'm a, an upper GI and bariatric surgeon, but also a, uh, uh, an, an endoscopist, a surgeon endoscopist. And uh, my task was to discuss if endoscopy does play, play a role in the pandemic of, uh, of obesity. Uh, obesity, it is a pandemic, but I know very well being a bariatric surgeon that I'm treating only probably between one and 5% of patients. So very few patients are actually eligible to be uh, treated surgically. And why is that? Uh, because a lot of patients don't believe that surgery is the right treatment for their weight problem. A lot of patients are afraid of surgery, afraid of uh, complication of surgery might entail. Some patients don't think that a, a, a surgical procedure may take care of all their comorbid conditions. And so they, they don't go and see uh, surgeons or just they're too frail uh, to undergo a, a surgical procedure. We also do know that surgery is very effective, but is not perfect and that some patients, a good amount of patients could regain all the weight that they've lost up to one year after even the most, I would say, uh, 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 successful procedures such as uh, um, ruin Y gastric bypass uh, is performed. So we're not perfect. And definitely there is a room for alternative treatment that could take care of the 95% of the obese population that does not uh, get uh, surgical uh, treatment treatment. And today we do know that we have a variety of uh, endoscopy procedures that mimic uh, the same mechanism of uh, weight loss that uh, surgery brings to patients. They, uh, we have procedures that will reduce uh, the gastric volume, procedures that will bypass uh, the duodenum, the first portion of the jejunum, probably not reaching the same uh, efficacy of surgery, but some of them are really becoming more and more uh, successful. I'm going to focus today because I only have a, little, a limited amount of time to uh, endoscopic suturing in order to uh, bring restriction uh, uh, to the gastric volume, in particular using two systems. The first one is the overstitch system. It's a system that I like very much because being a surgeon, I like a system that is capable of uh, uh, delivering full thickness suture in order to achieve a long-standing gastric reduction. The overstitch system can uh, come in two different uh, versions. The one that is uh, uh, applicable with a, a double channel scope uh, from uh, Olympus. Another one that is more recent, the S6 system that can be used with uh, any kind, most, most kinds of single um, uh, channel scope, which makes it uh, a, a, a usable in a, a variety of, uh, of situations. The nice thing about this system, it does, uh, as you can see here, really allow to do serosal to serosal apposition. A lot of other systems that were used in the past um, were capable of delivering very nice uh, plication of the stomach, but without achieving full thickness. And this is the reason why they all fail. We know it very well also for anti-reflux operation. This is the reason why we were all being surgeon a little bit skeptical, even when this system came along. But uh, uh, time told us that uh, uh, this was really capable of uh, delivering a surgical uh, restriction. And here is how uh, it works. 
works. I had the chance of learning this technique with uh, uh, many of the best surgeons, endoscopists and endoscopists in the world, including Manuel. So Manuel, I'm very grateful for having taught me so well. And uh, uh, what we do when we use this device, we create a gastroplasty starting from the incisura all the way uh, to the gastric fundus, sparing the fundus. So we are placating the greater curvature of, uh, of the stomach, creating a uh, 60 to 70 percent, uh, 70 percent reduction of the uh, gastric volume. We're not only reducing the gastric volume, we're also shortening the stomach. And by doing so, we are uh, delaying uh, significantly the, uh, the gastric emptying. And uh, what this uh, uh, makes is, uh, is to have food retention also at the level of the fundus, uh, um, preserving and prolonging satiety to uh, the patients. So what are the best patients for this uh, procedure? This procedure can be used as a primary procedure, but also as a bridge to surgery or as a revisional procedure to fail bariatric surgery, both bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. We will focus on the primary procedure. I believe it's a very good opportunity for, for patients that have a lower BMI, uh, less, than, uh, less than 35 with comorbidities or from 30 to 35 uh, to, uh, with, uh, with associate comorbidities. Super obese patients who are uh, at high risk to be operated on could benefit as a bridge to another procedure such as a bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy. Patients who have a frozen abdomen who are not amenable to sur surgery, patients who are too frail or uh, too high risk to be operated on and receiving a surgical procedure. Alter anatomy, uh, we, uh, we happen to do uh, at least three cases of sedus inversus, which is very easy to treat endoscopically, very complex uh, uh, to treat. Uh, surgically, uh, surg uh, surgically, patients at extreme ages, older patients or adolescents, I would not be very happy myself to perform a bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy in an adolescence, but I would have no problem delivering this kind of, uh, of therapy. Or patients who simply don't want to have a surgical procedure performed. Is this working? Is this uh, delivering enough uh, weight loss to our patients? Where this is a study that shows that the uh, overall weight loss uh, um, after uh, ESG in a total of uh, more than almost 2,000 patients shows a mean uh, um, total body weight loss uh, of 16%, which is uh, pretty good for a, a purely endoscopic procedure. It is something that is reaching the success rate of some uh, surgical operation. I'm going to share with you this historical uh, series from uh, uh, Gotran Lopez Nava, who is the uh, Spanish endoscopist who contributed greatly to the standardization of the uh, technique. And you see here that even at uh, long term, two years after uh, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, the excess body weight loss is about 60%, and the total body weight loss is 19 percent now these data are very very good it's probably the most successful data in the literature i myself in my series i'm much more i would say much less successful than he is but definitely i am more successful than any other endoscopic treatment i have uh, uh, done so far uh, what we see is that if patients fail or if patients succeed they do it early. So the, the first three to six months are a, um, extremely important in order to predict whether that patient uh, is going to be a good candidate to pursue an endoscopic treatment or whether maybe it's time to think about switching to a higher gear and proceeding to uh, a, a, more, a more aggressive treatment such as uh, surgery can be. Um, now what uh, we do know because we have been with our team looking at uh, uh, the endoscopic appearance of the gastroplasty every six months since the beginning for a two-year surveillance period that the uh, the aspect of the gastroplasty is related to the initial BMI and of course to the long-term weight loss. So the higher the BMI, the less likely the gastroplasty is to be disrupted uh, at six months and 12 months after uh, the procedure and it is associated with a uh, lower uh, success rate in terms of weight loss. But you could also find this kind of situation, which is uh, uh, something that I'm hopefully being capable to show you. Let me try this again. 
which is a perfectly intact uh, gastroplasty, a, a 12 months follow up. So you see that uh, when you scope the patient 12 months from the initial procedure, you can see this mucosal to mucosal bridges that have been formed during uh, over time. And you clearly see that the tubalization of the stomach can be preserved. And this is really thanks to the surgical uh, suturing system that allow us to have this longevity uh, over time. And of course, these are the patients who will do well even a long time after uh, the, uh, the, uh, the procedure. And this is something that uh, uh, we looked uh, uh, ourselves um, and uh, we could prove that there is a relationship between uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the status of the gastroplasty uh, we, uh, and, the, and, the, um, and the aspect of the suture. This is a procedure that not only impacts the weight loss, but also uh, the uh, comorbid uh, condition. And this is extremely important because being obese is not only being heavy, being obese is being sick. And I think that what uh, matters for most of the obese patients, at least for most of the patients I see myself, is that they not only lose weight, but most importantly, they get rid of uh, hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, and all the uh, other potential problems that are related to uh, obesity. What we did uh, is to compare how the uh, resolution of comorbidities and the weight loss uh, um, of a sleeve gastrectomy would uh, be uh, in relation to sleeve gastrectomy. And what we could see that, of course, uh, ESG was not as effective in, uh, in, uh, um, in uh, showing success in weight loss as is a sleeve gastrectomy, which had a better uh, excess body weight loss and total body weight loss at one year, but definitely could have a uh, similar impact in, uh, in uh, the resolution on the improvement of comorbid condition, uh, um, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, sleep apnea, with a much better quality of life and a, a much less, no, no impact on gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is something also that makes a, a lot of sense. What we do know is that uh, this therapy, it can be very effective, but it, it, is, it must be uh, um, associated to a multidisciplinary uh, team effort and uh, a follow-up with uh, both nutritional and psychological ca uh, counseling. And patients who fail are the patients who fail to follow up and to adhere to the uh, uh, post-operative uh, uh, visit. Uh, and this is very important for any kind of bariatric patient, no matter if if it's a surgical patient or, or an endoscopic patient. We sought to answer also another question that I've personally got asked every time I talk about this, uh, this procedure, which is what happens to the mucosa? You're creating this plication, these pockets. Do you have more ulceration? Do you have more gastritis? Do you have more macroscopic or histological diseases in the stomach? Because it's where we're working, but also in the duodenum and in the esophagus. And the answer is no. So whenever we uh, were doing endoscopies, we would look at the duodenum, the stomach, and the esophagus and take biopsies. And what we have seen is that the procedure has no impact whatsoever uh, besides an improvement in the gastric microscopic and histological uh, uh, microscopic aspect. So it's not something that is going to create a, uh, a, uh, um, a problem uh, uh, at the level of the uh, uh, upper GI, GI tract. It's a very safe procedure. Uh, uh, adverse events are minor. Adverse events are mainly, uh, I would say, related to um, um, uh, the uh, technical problems that are um, uh, at the beginning of the learning curve, where uh, people are still trying to understand on how to uh, understand anatomy and how to manipulate this uh, uh, suturing uh, suturing device. Um, on the personal side, I think that the position of the patient is particularly important. Uh, we do know that this is a procedure as all endoscopic therapeutic procedures should be performed under CO2 insufflation. Uh, uh, and with, uh, uh, with the patient, um, I, uh, either in general anesthesia, better or uh, under deep sedation. Position is important because uh, uh, in an obese patient, if you're working with a patient that is a, uh, in, uh, in a supine position, you have full knowledge of the anatomy. You can use gravity in order to move the patient around and have a good exposure. If you're performing the procedure with the patient in the side, which is something that is very often done in this 
patient. This can really uh, increase the likelihood of grabbing something that is outside the stomach. The device itself comes with a 1.5 centimeter needle and the Alex device that is used to grab the tissue can easily penetrate full thickness in the stomach. So you really have to understand where you're placing your bites and how you're retracting the tissue that has to go within the jaws in order to achieve a very good placation, but also doing a, doing it uh, safely. So uh, my piece of advice would be start with the patient supine, supine, do what you would do surgically, use gravity to push away uh, the bowel and, and push also lateral deliver and the spleen and the fat itself so that you will be much more comfortable uh, instead of using at the beginning the left lateral uh, decubitus. This will prevent you from having uh, having uh, a complication related to injuries to a Gijan organ. It's definitely something that is uh, doable. There are a couple of studies in the literature that describe the learning curve. Uh, this is a very nice study showing that technical efficacy can be reached uh, with about seven to nine cases. But I'd like to point out that technical efficacy, which means that you're mastering the technique, is not a proxy for success. I think that success as uh, Gautran Lopez never showed, uh, it comes really with a, the understanding on how you're going to reduce the volume of the stomach, so about 20 cases. Um, we can do it again. You can definitely resuture, and uh, if a patient is not losing weight correctly or still has a higher BMI, you can definitely go back and place uh, uh, additional suturing, re replicating the plication if it's necessary, and this is not dangerous, definitely doable. Other operation can be performed with no particularly uh, uh, particular difficulty afterwards. This is a case of uh, a patient who failed these procedures and we perform a gastric bypass. You will have these kinds of adhesions which are uh, definitely very easy to take care of from a surgical point of view. So you have no, not an alterate, um, uh, altered anatomy. And of course, as Manuel showed, you could also easily do a sleeve after an ESG, I would advise to do an endoscopy in order to avoid to stapler on the uh, cinching mechanism, which could be um, uh, tricky. Um, another very, uh, very nice device that is coming now, becoming more and more popular now in the market is the Indomina device that showed a great potential uh, to uh, uh, achieve a, a good uh, weight loss uh, six months and 12 months. is a slightly different device, which uh, provides also full thickness suture with a completely different mechanism. It, it looks a little bit more like, I would say, a sewing machine. There is a needle that shuttles up and down and placates uh, the um, the posterior wall and the greater curve of the of the stomach. It's something that definitely is worth following and learning if you want to enter this uh, field. So in conclusion, I think that uh, uh, um, bariatric endoscopy and in particular this two suturing system for placation uh, for gastroplasty are safe and are here to stay. They might target a completely different population from surgery and I think definitely a bariatric team should learn this procedure and uh, offer this procedure to their patients. They preserve anatomy, they're repeatable, they are, uh, can be a bridge to surgery, uh, they have very low morbidity, they can be uh, done as an outpatient procedure, this is the way we're doing it now, and we're starting to do it uh, under sedation whenever the anesthesiology is approved. So thank you very much, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Silvana. I think we have questions from Dr. Peterson to start with. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Peretta. That was a wonderful talk. I really appreciated it. Uh, I, I had a question as you were, and you were answering it just at the very end uh, with respect to bridging versus, you know, uh, standalone procedure and, and where you see that. But uh, one question that uh, I, I arise in, in part of your talk was um, you had showed the two year uh, results where the, you know, excess body weight loss was about 60% and the total weight loss about 19%. Um, and you were talking about like those being really great results. Um, and then in your practice, it's a little different. And I guess the question I have is, it, it sounds as though uh, the, um, that uh, this, this has been standardized, but yet it's, um, it's not as, maybe the question mark I have for you is, is it, uh, how reproducible is it? And, and, and then it sounds like you were uh, talking about that uh, a bit with respect to the results of the one year and ad an adherence to a post procedure plan. So um, how, how would you, I guess my question really is, how would you um, 
standardize it and then hopefully standardize it and uh, improve the post results. Uh, that's the question of the century. Uh, if you think that bariatric surgery uh, is difficult to standardize, try bariatric endoscopy. And I think Manuel will agree with me. It's very difficult to standardize. Also, because endoscopies have been extremely creative. If you look in the literature, you have at least 10 different suture patterns that have been described. Um, I'm very simple. I think that a, a per string surgical suture uh, with very clear landmarks, uh, it, it works very well. So in at our institution, we try to reproduce always the same technique with the same suturing system, because here now we have a second uh, newer a suturing system from the same company that uh, is the Essex device that it, it does change the technique. So I guess that uh, we all will need to agree on the landmarks. Uh, we all need to agree on the uh, uh, suture pattern. And then uh, in order to achieve significant efficacy, I think that you will need to uh, have a somebody that is more expert mentoring the first cases, really showing uh, uh, you where to place your stitches, because that's extremely important. It's easy to get uh, to lose track um, a little bit like fashion, you really need to know how you're going to contract uh, your your gastroplasty to achieve a a, a nice and uh, and uh, symmetrical uh, gastric uh, restriction. So training is very important. Mentoring is very important, and agreeing on landmarks and type of suture important is very important too. So Giovanna, I think it's uh, me now. So nice to see you again. Uh, quick question: uh, How does the endoscopic suturing fits on your uh, armamentarium of bariatric surgery, meaning how in the daily use you select your patients, how it connect with your busy bariatric practices on that, and if you think that now these procedures fits to be used in the clinical practice. Uh, that's a, uh, there, those are all very, very, very good questions. A lot of questions. Uh, I am, uh, um, uh, I, I think that this is a, I started in 2008 uh, and I started with uh, patients that nobody wanted to touch. So probably this is also why I have no problem admitting that my results are not as great as uh, yours or, or uh, Gautron Lopez Nava. Um, all my bariatric colleagues uh, gave me the patient they didn't want to touch. So patients who were too sick to have surgery, patient who had multiple operation, patient who failed everything else, uh, borderline indications. Um, I think that uh, at the big, that then we I had patients who were on the lower BMI uh, side. And now I have patients from all kinds of BMI, patients who do not want surgery, patients who uh, are uh, at the extreme ages. So we're working now with the pediatric surgeons and pediatric endocrinologists in order to include adolescents. So this is something that is very uh, safe as a uh, low morbidity and can be tried as a first step in most bariatric uh, patients who are compliant though, because if the patient is not compliant, is not willing to really uh, adhere to nutritional advices and, uh, and follow-up visit, I would not recommend to do this, uh, uh, this, uh, these procedures. The side effect of introducing uh, um, the gastroplasty is that uh, we had a, a, a huge increase in referrals, which we would not have expected, but the fact that we introduced a newer technique also increased the number of standard bariatric cases that we are doing. So I, I have to say that it has a major positive effect on my praxis, besides the fact that I am fully booked now until October uh, for this kind of procedure. So um, the risk that you might have is that you would have a very high number of patients to manage, and those are patients who need really to be very well um, followed by your multidisciplinary team. So we have we are looking into um, new IRs uh, in order to uh, um, increase the number of uh, uh, nutritionists and psychologists that can follow our patients.